And thanks for not leaving yet. <laughs> uh, I'm really surprised that anybody wanted to show up to a, a talk that had this weird of a title to it. But let me get started with it and show you what this is all about. Oh, good, that's working too. So, um, first of all, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot is this talk about. And uh, first, a little bit about me. You know, that's my uh, about dialogue. Um, like I said before, I've, I've been working with this stuff since uh, since forever, basically. Um, I've I've also had a pleasure of working in all sorts of places within companies. Okay, uh, loving stuff, doing development. I still do development. Um, I've worked in the executive office, and I've I've worked in uh, commercial software, scientific software. I made a big change after the dot coms because nobody would hire me anymore, and uh, became a coach. And I coach in all kinds of levels within organizations. Product work, I love the, uh, the practical stuff. I talk about process. Um, I do weddings, I do bar mitzvahs. You know, it's whatever you know, people were really looking for. Um, but when I first started out, it was kind of interesting because there were so few people out there called agile coaches, right? It's kind of like we all knew one another in a certain sense. So throughout my life, two things have been kind of a constant, you know, um, I mean, when I first started out, I got degrees in electro engineering. I actually got a degree in computer science way back when. Um, but those things have stuck with me all these years. And, you know, your first love, that was my first love. That's an IBM 1130. It had all of like eight kilobytes of memory and core. I remember uh, programming stuff like on these plotters you know, for translunar injections and stuff. It's really wild. And just to give you an idea of what I considered something perfect, this is a program. This is lovingly hand-punched. And if you put this into an IBM 1130 inside the card reader and press initial program load, it will now copy all the input deck into the output deck and make a copy for you in punch cards. Nobody's ever seen one of those for a long time. So, a few years ago, I was at a conference and uh, I was talking with uh, Neil Ford, and he had a, a talk where he mentioned a topic that was used by um, David Wallace at a commencement address. And then I took that and did a riff on it um, and wrote something about agile waste and agile fish. And the story goes something like this. There's these two guy fishes, and they're kind of sitting by the edge of the water, and uh, they're watching all the girl fish kind of go by. And then this older fish kind of wanders up, looks at the two guy fishes sitting at the side, <clears throat> and says to them, hey guys, how's the water today? And then he swims off. And the two fishes look at one another and say, water? What the hell is he talking about, water? Right, and the reason for this is that we live in a world where we don't see the things that cause us friction. We don't see the things in our environment that cause us problems. We never get to see the world as, you know, maybe it really should be seen. So I want to talk about that, but first I want to give you a little background um, in coming to some of the conclusions that I'll get to. And to do that, we're going to have to take a teeny little bit about digital electronics and specifically, and don't run away, this isn't bad, specifically about asynchronous versus synchronous circuits. So I'm gonna start with synchronous circuits because that's the ones we know the most about. Every circuit, synchronous circuit that's out there has a little oscillator inside of it. It's called a clock, right? The clock signal has to get applied to all the logic elements inside the circuit. And the circuit changes state based on its inputs and a, you know, a leading edge of like the pulse for the clock, and it then changes to some other state, okay? It's output state, right? Now, the changes require a certain amount of time to go through. That time is based on the speed of light, basically. And um, in a foot, a third of a meter, uh, you're talking about a nanosecond, right? So that's all called propagation delay. The period, right, that, um, the clock signal has to be made long enough for is so that all of the elements inside the circuit can reliably change their state given the amount of time that the clock is going to fire for. So that's what if you want a stable synchronous circuit, which usually you want, 
right? So they're great. But what's wrong with synchronous circuits? Well, the basic problem is they can be kind of slow, right? Because the maximum rate that the clock can run at is based on the longest propagation delay of the, of the logic inside of it. So, um, you know, most of the circuit is, is standing idle. Let's talk about asynchronous circuits for a second. There's no clocks, right? The circuit changes state as soon as the inputs change, right? And that means that their speed is limited to the speed of the propagation delay within the gates themselves, which can be a really wonderful thing, right? You get higher performance, lower power consumption, because not everything has to come on at the same time. You can use these circuits better <coughs> because you don't have to worry about a high fan out. So uh, the clock, right, is one, one thing, and it's got to be present to the entire circuit, which means that you might be sending out to billions of places all at once, right? And um, asynchronous circuits can adapt better to changes in temperature and voltage because they don't have to worry about that, that lock speed, right? Um, now, there's also issues, the larger you make the die for integrated circuits, um, the more problems you're going to have with variability and defects that come out of it. Asynchronous circuits, because by their nature are more adaptable, have less of that problem. Asynchronous circuits are also used in places where you can't use synchronous circuits because of the clocks, because they cause a lot of uh, electromagnetic interference. And the other problem is that because of the nature of that power cycle, driving that oscillator, fanning it out to the entire circuit, you get all kinds of power distribution problems within the circuits. So asynchronous circuits, you know, are kind of nice. In fact, they've been around for a long time. The very first computer, the ILS, was actually built around 1945 um, by a guy by the name of John von Neumann, who's standing next to his uh, machine, right? Um, and for those of you that forgot about what von Neumann architecture is all about, this was the first machine that did it. Talks about the separation of a processing unit from a control unit. You got some uh, memory where you can store both data and instructions, which has been a problem with security nowadays. Um, input and output, right? The ILS, binary computer, 40-bit words, it stored a thousand of them. <laughs> it also uh, had two comp two's complement format. Um, and it used 1,700 vacuum tubes. In addition to the vacuum tubes, it also had to have memory, which was put together on what were called selectron vacuum tubes made by RCA, which kind of look like this, which are really cool, really complex, really hard to put together. In fact, they were so hard to put together that they couldn't use them, right? Instead, they, they were forced to make a change to what are called Williams tubes, but they both operate approximately the same way. You put a pattern of dots, the phosphor glows for a little bit, has some persistence, you can read back whether there's a dot there with some metal that you place on top of it, right? The Williams tubes look like cathode ray tubes because they're cathode ray tubes. Um, the, the machine measured three meters by three meters by about a meter, weighed about uh, 450 kilograms. And look at these times, right? Again, it was asynchronous, not everything completed the same way. Multiplication took about three quarters of a second and addition was about an order of magnitude faster. So it wasn't just uh, with old computers. I'm going to jump a couple of decades ahead. Um, back in the 70s and stuff, there was a lot of export control of the United States towards what was then the Soviet Union. And the guys in the Soviet Union said, well, we'll build our own then. And what they wanted was PDP-11s. And the way they did it was ingenious. They put together bit slice processors that allowed them to emulate PDP-11s. Those are controllers that went with them. Uh, about a decade after that, back at Caltech, the very first asynchronous microprocessor was put together. So these are those Soviet air um, ICs. This is what the mass looked like on the Caltech uh, microprocessor. And this is the microprocessor in action. Why do I have this picture here? The whole thing is being powered by a potato. Very, very low uh, currents needed. Um, there was a lot of success in the microcontroller uh, region. There's a very famous chip 
which I'm not going to get into the details. You can read them if you're interested. The 80 Charlie 51, uh, which is actually used in a lot of things like the uh, Oyster cards in uh, Hong Kong. Um, and they're very popular because they take an extremely low amount of power. You just wave them over the reader, burst, they get a little energy, they do their job, and they're off. Right? And they had over 2 billion chips back in 2013, last time I could check. I'll show you some more modern ones. This happens to be an um, asynchronous chip used for an Ethernet switch, which had characteristics that allowed them to do a terabit of data per second, which is a huge amount of data being passed, you know, in a, in a small amount of time, right? Yeah, it looks like a it looks like a can, and then underneath this is what the pinout looks like, and the specifics are not important, right? Um, field programmable gate arrays, which are basically ICs that you program the logic after the manufacturer is done, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that was done with that, blah blah blah. Neuromorphic computers, more recently by IBM, right? So here the idea is that um, we want to be able to emulate the way that the brain works with neurons and synapses. And IBM put together the most complex microprocessor to date, uh, which way over, with way over 5 billion transistors on it, right? And each of the each of the chips has a whole bunch of cores. Each of the cores you know, has stuff on there that are basically in silicon emulating what a neuron would look like. They're not neurons, right? Neurons work electrochemically and they actually change as you store stuff in them, for example. Well, this is the best approximation. This is how it looks when it's packaged together. You can look at this little brochure thing, All right? So that's an interesting thing because now we are thinking about how can we get past von Neumann's laws? Okay, we don't need von Neumann machines anymore, so we have to do something with it. So, it, they're a hot topic, actually, in digital logic design nowadays, because people have recognized that Moore's law, that the doubling occurs every 18 months because of shrinking die sizes and faster machines, we're reaching the limits based on physics, right? Uh, so, we don't have to, whoops. We don't have to worry anymore about clock skews, right? We'd like to get past the power requirements. Most supercomputers nowadays are limited, not by the amount of processing they can do, but by the amount of heat that they take. Um, instead of getting worst case clock driven uh, cycles, we now can talk about the average speed, okay? Um, which is gonna be faster. Um, the global timing issues are, are fixed up. Um, and we can adapt to the physical properties better, especially the environmental concerns. So, why don't we have all, why aren't all of our chips asynchronous? Why do we still develop brand new chips year after year that are synchronous? And basically, what it boils down to is that it's simpler to do. We have the tools to do it. We educate the, the designers to think that way. Um, and that's why we keep on pumping them out. This will change over time. Okay, you know, within the next few years, you're going to see a lot more asynchronous chips that are out there. Anyhow, that's enough electronics. Thank you for, for staying for that. <laughs> okay, let's talk about software development now. I claim that organizations are becoming more and more like synchronous digital circuits. And the reason that they do that is that in the face of complexity and complicated things that they want to do, a lot of organizations, and here I'm talking about quote unquote enterprises, right? Um, they're risk adverse, they're afraid they can't do bigger things, they need to scale the organization, and they always talk about scaling agility, you know, to accomplish that kind of stuff. And what happens is they start using clocks, right? But like those fish, the agile fish, they don't see the clocks that are out there. But we call them different things. We call them things like PI planning. We call them things like meetings. We put them in our agile process tools. And we employ these things with ARTS, the agile release trains. All right? They're all clocks. And I'm going to try to get you to see some of that stuff. So now. 
you're probably saying, oh, so you're saying that all of this safe, everybody knows SCAFE, the SCAFE, the scaled agile framework, saying all that stuff's all wrong. Well, kind of, <laughs> but I'll tell you this, it's a great business to be in. Now, this is a picture of a doctor that I just recently started to see. Um, and um, this guy, uh, what happened was my gastroenterologist had kind of like run out of ideas. So he said, you got to go to the Mecca, you got to meet one of these guys. And he sent me to this fellow. The, the guy is a professor at Mount Sinai Hospital, but he also takes on patients that he finds interesting. And um, he's the best doctor I've ever met, right? He's really smart. He's got a great bedside manner, you know. Um, and after I spent several hours with him and going home, I realized that there's three types of doctors in the world. There's doctors like this fella who writes papers. He's got a, a huge amount of papers that are out there peer reviewed. He attends conferences and talks at them. There's guys like my gastroenterologist I have right now who will read the occasional paper and learn something new. And then there's doctors who are licensed. They're, they can practice medicine, right? Um, but they only learn of new things through pharmaceutical reps and maybe product brochures, right? And that's when I realized, wow, that happens in software development as well, with all due deference to the vendors that are outside. So let's look for some clocks, if you will, in this popular scaled agile framework. Oops, gave it away with what it was. So does anybody start seeing clocks in here? I'm talking about, I'm talking about this kind of stuff. All right, we make a plan for two weeks, we make a plan for a day, we execute it. Oh, we got some other clocks over there. We'll stop and do a review. Oh, we'll stop and do a retro. Gets even worth with 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 you know Dean stuff because he now talks about how you have dependencies between the various silos. I'm going to call them what they are, the silos that are out there as teams, right? And then somehow they all magically meet together. Oh, we got one of those big PI planning events, right? The agile release train, even the way that it's put together on here with the chevrons is telling you there are clocks involved. We are going to get to the end of that and do a meeting, make some big decisions. Oh my God. All the way up here, I see clocks all over the place. And that's not a good thing. All right. Remember, clocks take more energy. Clocks are not the fastest way of doing things. Clocks uh, you know, need a lot of precision, not very adaptable. So here's just two very extremely damaging aspects to all of that stuff. The first is even though SAFE is sold as scaling Agile to the enterprise, the reality is that once we reach Dunbar's number, uh, which is about 150 people, you can't have effective PI planning meetings. Everybody know Dunbar? Raise your hands if you've heard that. He, okay, so Dunbar was a... Um, anthropologist who, who uh, worked in England back in the 90s. And he studied uh, primates and he studied uh, uh, aboriginal peoples and stuff and looked at the size of the brain <laughs> versus the number of people in the group that they worked inside of. Okay, and this is kind of what some of that, that stuff looks like. Um, and he extrapolated from stuff and verified his hypothesis that with humans, it's around 150 people, and after that, you can't keep track of stuff, right? And don't tell me that you have 4,000 Facebook friends. They're not really friends. I hate to tell you that. But um, they're acquaintances. Maybe they know your name, All right? So that starts showing up. The other problem with it is that SAFE requires what I like to call commitment-driven development, okay? So we have a lot of planning, right? That requires estimates of when things are going to get done. Those estimates are fraught with all sorts of variability that we can't know before we do it. So the work never matches the reality, and the dates require heroes, death marches, and specifically compromises on quality. Right? So <laughs> I, I saw this, and I was like, wow, this is really interesting, because I recognized the cone of uncertainty which came about from a very simple observation back in the Apollo program back in the 60s, that if you asked an engineer how long is it going to take something to get done, the shorter the duration that he said, the more accurate that estimate was, right? And it, and it forms this 
quasi-parabolic curve, right? And uh, somehow these things are placed on here. I'm not sure exactly what they all mean. I do know that parametric models like Kokomo 1 don't work. They only work in a predictive model. They were developed back in uh, IMS days in the early 60s, IBM and the banks in New York. And basically, I can count the number of fields that are input, count the number of fields are output, and give you a very good estimate of how long it's going to take to do that, because I do it a lot. Most of the software that we develop is all unique, so those kind of things don't work, right? And the problem, of course, with our estimates is that, you know, we're using our best guesses of what the estimates are going to be, but we can't really know because there's all these unknown unknowns that are out there. You know, the uh, resources aren't going to be available, the schedule is affecting us, all kinds of stuff. And you've probably seen this, Dilbert. Basically, uh, pointy-haired managers coming through and asking Dilbert for an estimate on the project. Dilbert says, uh, and the pointy-haired manager says, don't worry, I'm not going to hold you to that estimate. And Dilbert says, yes, you will. You'll put it on the plan, and you're going to forget that we had this conversation, and you're going to fire me when I go over budget. Pointy-haired manager comes back and says, fine, I'll fire you right now if you don't give me your estimate. Dilbert gives a wild estimate of $10 million, and pointy-haired manager says, nope, that's too much. Why are you asking me this then? You know, so that you can feel that you had input. Oh, I didn't know that feeling about having input should feel this bad. So the real problem, right, the real problem that we have to solve is that organizations have to stop trying to scale up agile practices to work for things that are enterprise big, and instead we should be scaling down the asks into something that we can manage well. And we should be looking for empathy with our real customers rather than trying to take what we call an agile or scrum uh, product owners, which aren't usually product owners, they're usually project managers with a different name, right? Um, we have to be able to start thinking about the right kinds of architectures, such as versioned APIs on microservices that can anneal and that can negotiate, but we're not going to get into that stuff right now, all right? I'll talk just a word about CI pipelines because people love that kind of stuff. There's a traditional thing called D D DTAP, which is develop, test, accept, and production, which sounds like waterfall, doesn't it, right? Um, and most of the agile release trains, the, the, the train wrecks occur when one DTAP pipeline doesn't give sufficiently pure code into something that's consuming the results of that pipeline. And then the engines sputter, and there's horrible deaths. And, you know, we shouldn't be doing this sort of stuff. We should be thinking about releases should not become something that's unusual and risky. Releases are why we develop software, right? We should get used to doing that all the time. So, You've probably heard, or at least I've heard, that meetings are where the magic happens. And it's like, Lord, help me, right? Because the sixth principle in the Agile Manifesto back in 2001 talked about the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within development team is face-to-face -face conversation, right? And I hear a lot of nasty stuff about this. I hear about how the sun never sets in our organization Right, our team can be distributed across the globe. I find that these aren't really teams. These are just a bunch of people that are kind of working on the same stuff. And most of the time, and again, bear with me, I'm from the States. Most of the time, these are teams that have US management and overseas development because of the costs. Why don't we meet face to face? I don't know, there's a whole bunch of reasons. A lot of people like to work from home. Others are in some other location some other time zone, some other language, uh, some other, uh, you know, even though most of the, everybody speaks English nowadays all over the world, and I, I apologize, um, it's not the first language of, for the developers of the world, right? And to be honest with you, I don't like speaking to people either. I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert with a lot of fat on top of it. Right, so I'm, you know, but if, if I don't go to stores, I don't like talking to people and having them talk back, right? I'd much rather order everything online. And then I found a unique thing, like, with this phone. 
right? And you probably got one too. You can actually use it. There's an app on here where if you press the right buttons, somebody else's phone will ring and then they can press the button. You can talk. It's like an amazing discovery, right? We keep on getting told by tool vendors that our problems are going to be solved with, and I'll mention some names here, Jira, Tracker, Version 1, Rally, WebEx, Slack, Sococo, Teams, and other enterprise industrialized process and collaboration tools. I don't think it really helps, right? Do we need to be disconnected from one another? Not really, but we do, right? We get on a WebEx or a, a, a Google chat or whatever, and we, you know, spend the first five minutes saying, can you hear me? Uh, am I connected? Am I echoing? Right? Or we play with the, the stuff that's on there. I like the way that she looks a lot better than I look with the glasses, but whatever. Right? Um, and what happens is the tool becomes our process. So most of our, like, daily stand-up, if you're talking about a scrum, is reviewing what Jira says about the status of all the stuff that, that what the tool was all about. We try to perfect it around that stuff, right? And of the three questions that you ask in Scrum, what did you do yesterday? What do you plan to do today? And what kind of things are impeding your progress? The status is the least important. That's, that's yesterday's stuff. It's how do we talk about what we're going to do today and work together. Um, ultimately, the tools tempt, uh, tempt us into thinking that work is done at the meetings. And it's wrong. And you can play things like bingo, you know, while you're, while you're waiting, where, you know, you get one of these maladies and you keep on going until you get a whole line of them, right? And the meetings tend to kind of look like this, right? Where nobody's really paying that much attention. We just wait until it's our turn to talk. So meetings will beget more meetings especially since meeting times I've seen over the years becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. It seems like nowadays, and you can tell me, the default meeting time is 30 minutes. And in 30 minutes, you're spending 10 minutes in the beginning getting everything set. And, you know, there's very little time to work. So by the time you're done, you have to call another meeting to then fix it, right? So from a lean waste perspective, we're losing because we're waiting on meetings rather than doing work. We're transporting issues between meetings, which inevitably means we're going to lose some important details. We have motion waste because we have to reestablish context and do task switching and so on and so forth. Let me just skip right over these guys. Yeah, we all agreed. Oh, we'll have another decision at the next meeting. Meetings are not where the magic happens, right? Um, we need real-time collaboration where one developer can lean over to another developer and say, hey, could you take a look at something? Could you help me do this? You know, that's where magic occurs. And that magic is because it's asynchronous, unscripted, and really productive. So there's one thing to take away. You might want to take away this. So how can we improve the situation? What would that kind of look like? The first thing I would say to do is to start with retrospectives. Most retrospectives that I see out there are very formulaic. There are things like form two lists, do less of that, do more of that, good, we're done, see you later, right? You need more real-time interactions. And I'm gonna steal unabashedly from the world of code retreats and start thinking about what did we just learn? What surprised us? And what will we do differently in the future, right? And getting a feedback loop going allows us to learn and figure things out. It also can allow us to use scientific method, make a hypothesis, do something, and then observe what came out of it, right? Um, and while we're at it, don't just celebrate the successes, try to celebrate the failures, right? Take a bow for doing the worst idea this week, okay? Allow that to become part of the culture of the organization, right? Also, of course, start single streaming, right? Getting one thing done and then the next thing done is how you get to be productive. It's not about starting tons of things. It's about finishing stuff that you started. So doing one thing and then finishing it is the optimal way of doing things. And getting your team to all do that, that same unit of work is even better. I also say, <clears throat> 
Yeah, this this came out of my lips about two years ago at a conference. All of a sudden, it came out like, I quit. <laughs> I quit all the Agile organizations, the Scrum, the Agile Alliance, the certifications. I just quit all of them, right? And we should start thinking about stop trying to scale Agile to all the planning and replanning, post-planning, pre-planning, swag estimations, high accuracy estimations. We should stop obsessing about the cost of development, right? And if we need to have that kind of stuff inside the organization, get people like our scrum masters to handle it. It's a dirty job. That's what they're hired for, right? Start talking about autonomy, T-shaped teams, full stack development, right? Hire good people and let them make good choices for their customers. Get their customers excited and delighted and you will do well. I also believe in good engineering, right? So there's a DevOps culture and I'll talk a little bit about more of that tomorrow. But, you know, good architecture allows for things like trunk-based development and continuous delivery. And that's where you want to get to, right? And remember, software is never done. Projects are done. Software is never done, right? You want to work on it and improve it over time. What else is in here? Oh, yes. Virtualization and how that can help, right? So the goal of our development is not to make great schedules and then abide by those schedules. The, the goal of our development is actually to shorten the cycle from concept to cache, right? And, uh, you know, waterfall, you know, DTAP uh, driven systems, right? Tells us in the very beginning when we get some kind of a concept, make a really detailed plan about how this is all going to play through and maybe make a decision of whether we should do it or not do it. And instead, start thinking in terms of like the pop and dicks and delay your decisions until the last responsible moment when you have the most information and can make the best decisions, which means instead of putting together a big, complicated plan, you put together a tiny plan, make an, make an experiment, show it to your, your customer that you have empathy with, and say, is this starting in the right direction? Um, I wish that scheduled uh, development worked. It would be nice and pretty and we could tie it up. We have the tools to work with that. A lot of people are trained to do that kind of stuff. But it doesn't work with software development, right? Um, also, we should start not getting away from pushing on schedules and getting towards pulling solutions. And, um, you know, when we do that, in other words, we can use the system to um, concept of infrastructure for code, you know, the terraforms of the world, the provisioning scripts of the world, um, build everything the way that we're going to do it in production, but do it in a smaller sense for like a QA system or a pre-prod system or... CI system, right, CI server system, right? Um, we gain experience doing that. We also gain experience in the concept of cattle versus pets. Show of hands, you've heard that expression. Oh, it's such a good expression, right? It used to be that, you know, the farmer would have a, the, the daughter of the farmer would have Bessie, you know, who would have a, a, a pet cow. And if it got sick, you bring in the vet, take care of Bessie, right? Nowadays, we don't want to do that, right? We want to work like the cowboys who used to drive the cattle from Dallas up to St. Louis. You got thousands of cattle. And if one gets sick, there's no vets around. You shoot it in the head, you have it for dinner. Um, and you get the other ones there, right? So we have to start divorcing ourselves from those asynchronous clocks. Containers make a lot more sense. We can test on the desktop and all the various servers are along the way. Uh, we can get rid of things like networking and uh, concerns about storage by using, you know, things like Docker Compose to help people along with that stuff. All right, it, it's a good way to start practicing. Um, and we also can practice by getting our requirements done up front in things like Cucumber, making executable requirements, and then putting fakes along for the pieces that we have to integrate with that aren't present. So let's wrap this up. There's a difference, of course, between synchronous and asynchronous circuits, and it all has to do with a clock. Um, synchronous circuits are not the most efficient nor effective circuits we can make, but they are the easiest to design, and so it is with organizations. They use those clock signals like, the, like synchronous circuits do. It's just that we're not trained to see them or think about them, or to think that they're actually even bad. There are a lot of vendors out there who want to sell you a process and software that will fix your organization's problems, 
most of those problems, I feel, are sort of like putting lipstick on a pig and giving them an Apple Watch. You're going to get dirty, and the pig isn't going to like it. And you're not going to get rid of your synchronous organization by next Monday, right, and make it run like an asynchronous CPU, right? But there are things that we can do iteratively that can help. Understanding that you have a problem is the first step along that road to recovery. I want you to keep looking for that water and thinking about the implications of swimming in it, just like the agile fish. And thanks to Douglas Adams, <laughs> I always have this so long, and thanks for all the fish. And we'll now have some questions, some answers, some debate, and we will depart. And so we've reached the end.